Hello and welcome. Here we are in lecture 16. And uh, before we get started in the lecture, I did want to take a moment to kind of preface this whole week's topics. So as you can see on the calendar, this week is dedicated to physical design optimization. So, so far in this course, we've primarily worried about just getting the design working. You know, we always talked about closing that loop, just getting something running, we'll worry about optimizing it later. Well, now it's later, we need to worry about optimizing it. <laughs> and so in order to understand how to optimize, we need to be a little bit conscious of what's you know physically possible and what it takes to build certain physical things. Uh, so as a result, it takes me a little bit more conceptual, kind of talking about some high level things in terms of what it takes to build chips and what certain things cost, as well as um, some architectural interventions we can do, you know, with our chisel designs, how to you know finesse it and make it work better. So in particular, today is going to be about introducing this whole physical design optimization world, as well as uh, focusing on memory. And we're going to come back to this throughout the week. We're going to talk about uh, logic synthesis a little bit more and clock rate kind of stuff on Wednesday. And then on Friday, we're going to talk about uh, design space exploration. So let's get to it. Oops. Uh-oh, I might have to restart uh, Jupyter at this rate. I think we have a runaway process. Oops. Great. All right. Well, thanks for <laughs> tolerant interruption. Hopefully, I can edit this out uh, in a minute. But let's go ahead. So as promised, today we're going to briefly touch on, you know, what does it mean to actually physically optimize your design? Uh, and we're going to spend a lot of time talking about memory, right? So why memory? We'll cover that later, but to kind of preface to it now, it's a, it's a large fraction of what we use hardware to do, right? You know, it's communication and computation, right? So it's a large thing. And so it's an easy thing for us to especially have an intervention with at the architectural level and a chisel level for us to kind of think about how we're using memories and what we want to use from them so we can be very impactful with. So uh, let's hop into this. So first of all, you know, why even worry about designing our physical implementation of our hardware? Well, easy, right? Efficiency. Uh, and so wh why efficiency? Why is it so easy? Well, uh, in the modern era, especially here we are in 2021, where uh, computing cores are like just about everywhere, uh, even something like a cable uh, actually is often an active cable and actually has processing cores inside of the cable, right? So because it's got a passive wire, no, even, ha even that has processing cores inside, right? There are cores everywhere. So for many tasks, to accomplish that really is as simple as writing software to accomplish that task and then putting an appropriately sized core uh, and shipping it off, right? And part of why software is, you know, proverbially eating the world is that um, people can make cores uh, that are very general purpose, right? And then they get used in many different applications. And so, if we're going to go through the effort of building specialized hardware, which I argue is actually happening even more often in the future, uh, it's because we really care about efficiency, right? It's that something about running this on, you know, a general purpose CPU wasn't appropriate, and we said we need to actually somehow tailor this hardware to our problem. And so if we're worried about tailoring the hardware to our problem, we're really worried about efficiency in some metric, right? Whether it be we want to use less area and reduce cost to get a task done, maybe we can get something that's really simple and need a full CPU, or maybe we want to get done a lot more efficiently, you know, much higher performance or you take less power. Um, so there's going to be some motivation for doing that, right? Uh, and so with that motivation in mind, that's definitely going to help us motivate why we're doing all this work, but also you should keep an eye on what benefit you're getting, right? Where, you know, me personally, my research interests are always with regards to efficiency. You know, I love making things go faster, uh, but that's not always what's most important, right? And so as I can emphasize in this course, worry about getting it right first. Uh, we're making, of course, also worry about making it useful. Then we can worry about optimizing it. So like I said, keep an eye on how much performance you're really going after, how much efficiency you're really going after, and then how much effort you're willing to spend to get there. Okay, so with that, uh, let's continue. Um, so what are we optimizing for? Well, there's actually three common metrics uh, for hardware design, right? There's power, performance, and area, right? So uh, power, uh, you know, is perhaps the most important in the modern era. Uh, you know, it's not just uh, things like uh, your energy bill at the end of the month, but it's also going to come down to um, how long your battery is going to last on mobile device, which of course many things are mobile and battery powered. Uh, power of course also impacts how much heat your chip will produce, which of course impacts thermals and cooling and that sort of stuff. And also impacts cost, right? If you have a desi uh, design that consumes more power, you need to put in a more expensive power supply. You need to put in a more expensive, more, you know, heavy duty, um, cooling apparatus. And you're of course also going to pay more for, uh, you know, the energy bill, right? So, uh, Power is, of course, quite important. Performance, I think, is the one we normally kind of think of. You know, oh, how long 
take new application or how many good things can get done per second from application, right? Um, depending on application, you may have more of a latency goal or a throughput kind of, you know, goal in mind. Um, but either way, there's some kind of notion of what, for your given application, what performance means, how do you want to kind of improve that. And then finally, there's area, which is kind of a way of saying just how much stuff does this take, right? How much hardware are we consuming? Um, and this, of course, is proportional to cost, right? If you're able to make your design smaller, that is consuming less area when it's manufactured as a chip, for a given wafer, you can now make more chips. And so when it comes to manufacturing wafers for chips, the price is roughly proportional to the wafer. And so thus, if you're paying the fixed cost for the wafer, if you have smaller designs, you get more chips uh, per wafer, and thus you can get you know, more profit on the same amount of cost, right? Um, so yes, you'd love to have it as small as you can, right? Uh, even on FPGA, right? Uh, even though your FPGA is a fixed size, if you shrink your design, you might be able to get away with a smaller FPGA for application and thus save costs there. So either way, uh, area is kind of about cost. So these three metrics are often referred to as PPA, uh, kind of all together, you know, people are referring to uh, those three things. And often certain trade-offs to kind of evaluate in terms of how it impacts these metrics. And sometimes we're gonna kind of have to trade them off, right? It's not gonna be guaranteed to improve all three at once. Maybe it's gonna improve one at the disadvantage of another, or maybe it's going to have one be like a hard constraint. Like you need to have something that fits on this certain size of FPJ. It's a hard area constraint, but then I want to, you know, maximize performance and minimize energy consumption or something. Um, so to give you a brief, uh, you know, flavor of some other metrics that, you know, are well beyond the scope of this course, which people often optimize for, there are things like, you know, manufacturability. Um, robustness to certain types of faults, perhaps robustness to faults for things like, you know, um, high energy particles or, you know, a ra a radiation, maybe it wants to go to a satellite or something, right? So there's also other things to consider, but for us, we're most concerned with PPA. Cool. Um, amongst PPA, like I said, you kind of need to really have a goal, right? Because otherwise you can easily just go wandering around and changing things. And if you don't have specific um, kind of thing in mind, it's gonna be very underspecified and you do a lot of things, right? So number one, you need to pick what you're optimizing for. So far in this course, we've been very agnostic saying, hey, we're just writing RTL and you know, we're getting things working at a cycle level uh, of performance, right? Um, but when you actually wanna really worry about optimizing, you need to pick a specific technology you're actually optimizing for. And the reason why you need to do this is because some optimizations are gonna make more sense than one technology than another technology, right? This, and software are very used to the fact, you know, if I improve my algorithms, my code goes faster. And although different CPU models might be a little different, uh, in general, if it's significantly faster algorithms, it's going to be faster on both, right? Um, that's not the case with hardware, right? Certain trade-offs in terms of how you're trading off uh, area versus power, you know, logic versus memory, those are going to be really impacted by which uh, implementation technology you're using. Um, and so it's really good to know what your goals are. And it's not just your goals for what you're optimizing, the tools are going to require this of you. So we're also used to in the software world of saying, hey, you know, here's my code, compile it, make it fast. Um, hardware tools, you know, you want to say, oh, here's my hardware design. Tell me how big it is or tell me how fast it is. That's a way unspecified problem for a CAD tool, right? It's going to instead say, no, 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 no. You need to give me some more constraints. And so typically you say like, okay, uh, here's my hardware design. I want to shoot for this clock rate. And here is kind of an, a bit of area to work with and then see if you can't go ahead and, you know, minimize area within that bounds and reduce power or something, right? So even there you're optimizing for two metrics, which already is kind of asking a lot. But the point is, yeah, you have to kind of say that, right? And so you have to kind of specify the problem. Like what's your goal? What are your metrics? What are your constraints? Uh, and kind of specify it. So, okay, now you have some idea of what you're going after. You also need to spend a little bit of time uh, actually measuring, right? Uh, you know. It's one thing to go ahead and say, I think this thing is, you know, inefficient. Or I think this thing could be better. So I think that you show to yourself that, you know, this particular thing you're worried about uh, is actually a significant consumer of some resource you're worried uh, of interest, right? So, for example, you really want to measure before you um, take any big steps, right? You want to make sure the thing you're going to optimize is actually consuming a lot of resources and you have a reason to believe the optimization will actually, you know, return those resources. And those resources aren't necessarily area. It could also be power or even time for performance, right? So it's just something where, you know, measure it and then also kind of do some analysis to think about, you know, well, how much can I actually benefit in this problem and how much could this actually help? Because it's really easy to get really excited about some little niche thing. It turns out it's a small fraction of the area, small fraction of the overall thing is making a real big dent, right? And so 
kind of go after the biggest things first, or actually more appropriately, the things you have the most impact on first, I should say. Um, now, what we've done in this course has been really helpful for this process, because we're not just making single designs, we're making generators, right? So when it comes time to actually optimizing your design for your technology, you're going to want to make various trade-offs and tune things. You're going to want to say, oh, well, if I change the way I implement this, what if I change the way I implement this? What if I, you know, parameterize, you know, how big this certain structure is or how many of these units there are and how they're interconnected, I can kind of make these tweaks. That's much, much easier with a generator than it is with a single instance, right? If you only have a single instance, oof, how do you do that, right? Well, you have to rewrite it, which would be very painful, or you spend a lot of time trying to model things in advance to try to do uh, that design exploration at a model level, which may not be as uh, accurate as you would like, right? Perhaps your models aren't as faithful as you're hoping and you get misled, right? And so it'd be much better instead if you have a generator, you can tune those knobs uh, and do design inspiration with the actual design, right? And running through the actual CAD tools. Um, so that's a real big strength of the kind of generator-based approach, right? Additionally, with a generator, you know, perhaps those knobs are going to be turned one way for one technology and they're going to turn those knobs another way for another technology. But in both cases, it's the same generator producing the design, right? So that's, that's that reuse argument we've been talking about so much. Um, so yeah, so really, this kind of stuff is where a generator really shines, right? It's not just about getting it right once, but really kind of, you know, making something reusable. Even something that seems as straightforward as, you know, implementing a, you know, highly specified hash standard, like we've done in some of the homework assignments, realize that there's, there's some trade-offs, right? You may make some, you know, time, space trade-offs, right? You may decide, uh, you know, perhaps I want to use more logic and it's done in fewer cycles, or you know what, I really want to shrink this and, you know, reduce my area and it's okay if it takes longer, right? We saw that for a homework problem, right? And, uh, you know, even though some of the hash seems like so straightforward, oh, it's definitely has that ha standard hash, there's already some knobs you can kind of put in there, right? And so having a generation and kind of viewing things as more parameterized generators really kind of changes the way you approach uh, hardware design. Um, and as I said, we're going to be considering how to make trade-offs across these various metrics and how to kind of do that using our generators as well as working well with the tools. And we're talking more about this in the coming week. Um, for now, let's just get excited about the fact that we have the ability to make these trade-offs uh, by, you know, adding flexibility and parameterization into our generators. Whew. I've been going pretty fast for a while, so I'm going to make sure I had a pause in case there's any questions so far. Okay. Well, uh, let's continue. So um, I've been kind of taking some time to contrast hardware design from software development. Uh, this is me trying to make this course, uh, you know, uh, more accessible for those who are, have a big of a hardware background. Um, and so here's some, you know, very opinionated takes on some differences between what's like developing software versus developing hardware. So in software, of course, I wouldn't call it easy, but I'm calling it easy in jest here in quotes. Um, you know, we think about what goes into a project, right? spend a lot of time implementing things, probably spend a lot of time testing things. We often call it testing around verification in software. Um, but okay, you spend most of the time building it. And then when you worry about optimizing, you usually worry about just performance, right? Uh, although there's some people in the research community who worry about things like, oh, how do I, you know, optimize energy efficiency of my code? Uh, for the most part, uh, if your code goes faster, it takes less energy, right? And so you usually worry about making it go fast. And for most software things, like I said, if you make it uh, faster on one CPU, it's going to be faster on other CPUs, right? You know, if you algorithmically reduce the amount of work you're doing, that's going to carry over to another CPU. If you do some tricks to improve your locality, right, and improve your cache performance, that's going to carry over, right? And so it may be the parameters may be tweaked a little bit, but it's in large part going to be still be useful, right? And so we're used to kind of thinking about software and optimizing it, and you know, oh yeah, this is optimized, right? And then, oh yeah, I can download and it's optimized for me too. And most of all, when working with software, we really kind of just trust our compilers, right? We just throw code at it and we get software at the other end. I've been programming now for over 21 years. Uh, I have actually only once in my entire career ever come across a situation where I was able to convince myself and even prove that the compiler produced the wrong result, right? The other times, uh, you know, if there was something wrong with the program, it was my fault, right? Um, so you really can trust the compilers. Um, and they're really well automated, right? You often can just chuck code at it and say, you know, dash O2, dash O3, and it makes all sorts of sophisticated decisions for you automatically. It's really nice. Um, unfortunately, some of those things are different in the hardware world, right? So uh, for making a, a chip, right, implementing it in RTL is just the beginning, right? <laughs> you have a lot of work to, to be done in terms of optimizing this physical design, uh, as well as verifying it, right? There's a huge amounts of effort, often bigger than the original RTL implementation. 
Um, in contrast, optimizing for only one metric of performance, now we're worried about three things. We're worried about you know power, performance, and area, all three, PPA. So it's like now a multidimensional optimization problem. Um, and simulations are very un un non-portable, right? We make all these optimizations for one technology, and then also we change technologies, and they have to reconsider those, those optimizations. That's a real headache. And that's part of what causes challenge for reuse in hardware design is that you know, people want optimized components, and they spend this time optimizing it for their design case and their uh, technology mapping, and then now with some different design case, different technology mapping, and you want different trade-offs, right? So you need that generator to kind of be more flexible. Um, and worst of all, in my opinion, are the tools, right? So um, if you're working with a hardware design tools, these CAD tools, uh, they're much more complicated than a compiler, right? Where a compiler, you know, you throw code at it, maybe use a tool like Make to kind of orchestrate larger builds. Um, with the CAD tools, there's a lot of tools, not just one tool. Um, and that kind of goes through it, it's all these things referred to as a tool flow, the kind of send you designs for all these tools. And um, unfortunately, there's a lot of human intervention and oversight required, right? Where the tools usually do the right thing, maybe you get a little check, they frequently make mistakes. So there's actually other tools you use to verify to make sure that the tools didn't break. So there's things, for example, when it comes to like a final chip design and you want to make sure it's manufacturable, uh, there's something called a DRC check or, or design rules check, right? And um, I'm always going to use this as necessary because, you know, I didn't actually physically out my design. The CAD tools did, but the CAD tools can still get it wrong and disobey their own rules they should be aware of, right? So that's why things like DRC are important. Um, so they require frequent uh, human intervention and oversight. Now, this has been identified as a big problem. And so there's actually some really encouraging research efforts trying to automate larger portions of this tool flow and make it more friendly. For example, uh, there's the open uh, road and open lane projects taking research CAD tools and trying to automate a lot of the flow and requiring less invention between these stages. Oftentimes for a project, there's a large amount of effort required to set up a tool flow for that project. That is to figure out which tools are going to be working, you're working with in this particular design, uh, making them all properly mapped to the right technology, work with the right technology, and then you know making various tweaks and nudges along the way to make your design go through these tools best. So there's a lot of people who spend their entire careers doing this, and it would be nice, in my opinion, if you could automate them out of this, right? Even though I don't want to unemploy people, it's just a huge barrier to chip development. We'd rather have these things be automated and faster. Um, okay, so that's kind of, you know, a very opinionated take in this kind of two different worlds. If I'm going to give the hardware design uh, tools, manufacturers, producers any credit, let's appreciate they're actually solving a different and arguably harder problem, right? Think about software, taking programming language, you know, turning that into assembly code. The computational model, you know, in computers hasn't really changed in, you know, many, many decades. And, you know, yes, the ISA may change a little bit, but for the most part, if you look at what's happened over years, right, okay, computers get faster, software gets a little bigger, but mostly that basically just gives compilers more computational resources to do more sophisticated optimizations. Meanwhile, if you consider what's happening in a hardware design world with Moore's Law, hardware designs are growing in size exponentially, right? So... Uh, okay, your tool can handle this, great. All right, in two years, I want you to handle something twice as big. Uh, or in 10 years, I want you to handle something that's 32, 32 times as big, right? And you can see over a few decades, I was talking about designs that are thousands, millions times bigger. Um, and the tools need to handle that, right? If you actually ask these tools to optimize for a very old technology node and a very small design, they're gonna slam dunk it, right? Part of the challenge you're dealing with is scaling to uh, newer technologies which have all sorts of very crazy demanding requirements placed on the tools as well as very, very large designs. But guess what? We often care about new technologies and very large designs, so thus we have to kind of run into these challenges. Okay. Uh, this is for the slide from the first lecture. We talked about kind of contrasting the philosophies of hardware design. We talked about no waterfall, where it's kind of very deliberately going from stage to stage, and perhaps now we have more appreciation for this, right? There's so much effort spent on optimizing design physically, we really want to make sure it's, you know, well-placed and we have things planned out and it's going to work, right? Versus our agile approach, I want to kind of get these tools more automated. We can run them more often and get more spins through the design flow, right? You know, more times seeing um, what the outcomes are and then adjusting based on that, right? Uh, and so that's kind of the goal, right? We want to have this kind of incremental thing and kind of keep improving. And so, yes, yeah, so you can see on the right here, we're going to be taking our design and we're going to be just implementing for generators, frequent generators, why not? Get some feedback and optimize it, and then, you know, of course, make sure it's correct and keep repeating this process, right? Keep improving it. Okay, so 
uh, if you were to try and summarize what goes on in a CAD tool flow in one slide, this is what that would be. It's of course, it's a lot of tools doing a lot of things. They go from Verilog to an actual manufacturable chip. There's a lot of steps, but at a high level, here's what's going on, right? We have RTL going in, our hardware design going in. And at the other end, we want a chip design we can send off to a chip manufacturer to go make our chip. So what happens in between? Well, there's three main steps, uh, synthesis, placement, and routing, right? So synthesis is the process of taking uh, you know, our description of what things should do. And, you know, even when we write chisel, we're going to turn that chisel into Verilog with the tools automatically. And it's okay. They're going to ingest that Verilog and figure out how to do it. And they can do some logic optimization and figure out, oh yeah, here's a, you know, more efficient way to express what you described. Or I can do things like common sub-expression elimination, that sort of stuff. These tools can do that. But fundamentally what they're going to do is they're going to take your design and map that to physical technology, right? This is why it's so important for you to actually have that specific technology you're targeting because they need to know what they're mapping it to, right? They need to know, for example, does technology have you know, a five input and AND gate? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. If it doesn't have a five input AND gate, this tool needs to realize, okay, we'll need to break it up into you know, multiple layers of two or three input AND gates, for example. Um, so that's going on in the synthesis process. After it's taken your design and mapped it to these components that make sense in technology library you're using, technology you're working with, it then is gonna go ahead and place these, right? Um, so it figures out where they go in 2D space, or and now in the future, hopefully soon, 3D space, um, and tries its best you know, to minimize distances and put things that use each other nearby. Then, in the third step, it is what's called routing, and routing is referring to routing the wires to connect these things, right? So you connect all the things up, you know from your design what's connected to what, and you need to make sure all the wires are connected, right? And you can imagine, you know, if there's enough components, enough wires, it's gonna be quite a tricky problem. Uh, fortunately, in modern chips, there's often, you know, many layers, not many, but, you know, half a dozen or more layers of room for wiring. So that way you can, you can imagine on a 2D plane, otherwise you might have a lot of wire crossings. To handle those crossings, of course, you can go up and around things, right? And so that's what those other layers are for. So that's a really fuzzy uh, hand wave overview. And the reason why I kind of give it, just in case you hear these terms pop up, you'll know what they are. Understand the real tools are a lot more complicated, there's a lot of tools involved. Additionally, even though I drew this as a nice, you know, feed forward flow set of arrows, there's actually a lot of feedback and execution in the real process, right? Where um, you can imagine uh, there's all sorts of cases where these tools need to talk to each other, right? Where actually you could synthesize better if you knew something about what, how it turned out later on in the design flow. Or perhaps you might want to place differently if you knew something from routing. So there's often a lot of feedback interactions between these various stages and these various tools, and you often re-execute certain things. For example, maybe you get through the entire flow and you find you have a critical path. You know, there's something that's too long relative to your target clock frequency. Uh, and so what do you do? Well, you go see if you can't optimize it. Maybe you can move things around, move those components closer to each other and get a better, uh, reduce those wire lengths. Maybe you can actually can go talk to the synthesis tool and say, hey, could you resynthesize this with you know, faster logic to use more resources to try and you know, fix this path, right? And so there's a lot more feedback and back and forth in these tools. Um, and like I said, also comes to actually making things manufacturable with a whole bunch of other set of constraints and tools. But um, this gives you a high level picture. And of course, this is even bringing in verification, but I will come to that later too as well. Okay. Um, questions on this? Okay. So we're going to shift gears uh, a little bit. Still related. Let's talk about memory, right? So um, why? Well, the reason why is, like I said, it's a significant portion of hardware designs. It's often half, if not more, of the area involved, right? Think about like a processor die. Uh, typically half the area is caches. Now, even within the portion that's not um, caches, you know, we think of, oh, those are the processor cores, those are all logic. Actually, inside that logic, there's actually quite a bit of things that look kind of like memory, in quotes, right? You know, things like, uh, structures for your branch predictors or other things like that, right? So actually, um, memory, you know, broadly interpreted is actually like I said, a very large consumer uh, of cost, right? Additionally, also imagine like on like a desktop computer, for example, okay, you have your CPU die, which, you know, maybe half or more of that's dedicated to memory for caches and the like. Then you have your DRAM DIMMs, right? Which also are actually a, in aggregate a surprising amount of silicon area, right? And it's also dedicated to memory. So memory is a, a large thing. And it's something that actually can have a large impact on as a designer. Um, and so it says cost, it's a large consumer for off chip, you know, memory, you know, things like actually buying the components, you know, actually buying the dims adds to the cost, you know, for servers often somewhere between a quarter to a third of the price 
of buying a server into DRAM. Um, additionally, depending on your application scenario, uh, routing all the wires from your you know chip to the memory components, that's non-trivial sometimes, right? It's the it's cost of making the piece, the circuit boards to line those things up, the pins getting out of the package that adds to the cost. Meanwhile, for even purely on-chip memory applications, right? Things like those caches you're talking about, it's a large portion of your area, right? As we said earlier, area is proportional to cost, so you really want to reduce your area, and thus you want to, if you can, reduce the memory area, right? Additionally, if you remember from your architecture courses, memory is a big challenge for performance often, right? Typically, uh, the latency for accessing memory is much higher than we would like, and that's a problem for performance. Um, but sometimes, even if you overcome the latency, bandwidth becomes a problem, right? Uh, you just can't like, get enough data in and out at a quick enough rate, right? And so, uh, those are well-known challenges. And just, you know, asking ourselves, okay, well, why are we going through all these headaches? What do we use memory for? Well, number one, it holds our data, right? Whether it be the application inputs and outputs and intermediate state. Um, perhaps another perspective might be able to kind of toss into that uh, viewpoint is, think of memory instead of it just being this, you know, simple storage device, actually it's kind of as like this all-purpose connector or almost like a network in some ways, where you think about what it's doing, uh, some agent, whether it be a processor or even just a little hardware component, puts something into a memory, and then later on, something else takes it back out, right? And so that's a producer-consumer, you know, flow of data. There's some data flow there. Uh, however, you know, that was done through memory over time, right? The producer wrote it first, the consumer wrote it later on. And what's interesting is, you know, you might think, oh, the memory is a single port or maybe a single entry point, and that's just, they're going out the same point, but the memory is actually facilitating many, many potential connections, right? And this actually is uh, interesting because, you know, sometimes these producer consumer relationships aren't known in advance, right? Perhaps, you know, it's very much data dependent on your application, where things get written, who's going to read those later on. And so if we want to, instead of, you know, using a memory and try to, you know, manually have wires connecting things from the producer to the consumer, we wouldn't know who to connect to who because we don't know that in advance. Other times, maybe we aren't willing to kind of dedicate those wires. It's much easier to just put things into memory and read it back out. Um, it's a little bit of a different way to kind of view memory. But in general, it's something that's a very kind of important uh, big thing to kind of keep in mind. Um, so uh, you're going to hear a few terms. I want to make sure to kind of quickly recap some of these terms. Uh, we're on the same page. Right, so capacity, of course, refers to how much uh, storage your memory can hold. Um, and so often maybe we express it as a total capacity, you know, in bits or bytes. You may hear it as, you know, M words times the, the word size. Um, latency, of course, is how long it takes to perform a memory operation, whether it be a read or a write. Oftentimes we're most concerned about the reads because uh, the writes, you know, we don't see latency because it's, you know, uh, going into the memory. Bandwidth refers to how the throughput can get data in and out of memory. So it's no data over time. Uh, when we talk about using memory, we often refer to it in terms of requests. You know, I'm sending a request to memory to get uh, data. You know, it's a read request. Or it might be sending data you want to actually be written to memory, in which case it's a write request. Right away, it's kind of the name for an access. Often it's a request, kind of saying, here's what we want the memory to do. Uh, you know, each of those axes have a certain width, how much data retransferring. Um, and uh, one perhaps maybe a new term for some people is for thinking things in terms of a memory port. Right, so, uh, you know, memory like this figure down below, uh, you know, if you actually want to access it, right, you probably need a couple uh, different related signals, right? You need to have uh, an address, you know, where you're accessing. In the case of a write, you're going to need to send the data you're going to write. And you're probably also going to want to have the ability to turn this port off, right? Because you don't want to be writing garbage data sometimes. So you have maybe an enable signal, right? Right, so this is what you might want for a write port. It might be actually three different things, right? An address, the data and the enable signal, but altogether it's referred to as a port, you know, it's the way to get in and out of memory. Um, you might have another port for reading, for example. Um, and so very often, and the kind of thing we're gonna see throughout the rest of today's lecture is that the number of these ports is often a big constraint where uh, depending on the technology using for a memory, there's kind of a limit how many ports you can feasibly build. And that kind of puts a cap on how many uh, simultaneous things you can do accessing this memory at the same time. Uh, and so then uh, you also may hear this phrase, you know, requests in flight, referring to, you know, requests that have been sent to memory but aren't yet completed, right? So um, it may require a little bit of extra hardware and memory to kind of have multiple requests in flight rather than just one, but you do want to have that kind of parallelism. Cool. Okay, so kind of a brief recap of memory terms. Um, if you take an artistic course with me, you know I'm really excited about this concept. It's Little's Law. What's Little's Law? It's a great way to result from queuing theory to kind of 
understand certain trade-offs. In particular, the trade-off you want to understand is how do you know bandwidth, latency, and parallelism relate? Here's the result, right? So, um, what does this matter? Well, if you think about it, let's say I have a t uh, an object and do one thing at a time. Okay, so it takes some latency to complete that task. And then, okay, well, what's the throughput? Well, it's one over that task, right? It's how often I get that thing done, uh, the rate at which I complete it. Now, if I can get multiple things going at a time, then uh, that's going to increase the throughput linearly, right? As you can see here with this equation, right? And so uh, this really simple relation is actually really helpful for us kind of understanding things. For example, maybe um, latency is fixed. I only make my memory so fast, but I really want to improve throughput. So does this tells me in order to do that, I need to increase parallelism, for example. Um, this is like a really kind of handy rule of thumb for architects. Uh, and as a reminder, if you wonder how this kind of works out in practice, these are all average, right? So it's actually average parallelism equals average throughput times average latency, and it actually does hold. Uh, and so, yeah, that's a pretty helpful little uh, tool. Um, okay, so let's talk about some practical considerations for memory. Uh, so I said, our goal is we really want to reduce the cost and performance detriments caused by memory. Uh, and so what are some common pain points? Well, uh, as an architect, often we're worried about, oh my gosh, the memory latency is too high. Uh, or you talk to a physical designer and you're saying, uh, you know, you request too many memory ports, right? Um, like a typical SRAM array, usually, you know, two ports, three ports if you really want it is kind of the max typically. And so, yeah, you don't get 16 ports to an SRAM array, right? That's, that's a problem. So if your architecture design is expecting that, we need to kind of consider that. Um, or perhaps this is not enough bandwidth, right? How do I get the bandwidth I need? Uh, and so how do I go about fixing this? Well, this is the best place to really have a significant impact on the overall design is to try and solve some of these issues, right? Um, they can try and work the application folks to be very clever about how much memory capacity they need. Hopefully they can reduce the capacity they need. Uh, and then they can pick the, uh, you know, also try and pick the densest and cheapest technology they can. Um, try and save costs that way. Uh, if possible, they want to maybe make their design more tolerant to more memory latency. Like, it's easy to say I want the fastest memory possible, but if I can make my design work well with a slower memory, I'm definitely going to save cost and energy that way. Um, and of course, also being clever how to use an application to reduce bandwidth demand. So we're going to come to that later in the lecture today. Um, so we're not going to get too much in details about the exact nuances of every memory technology, but you know, you've probably seen this in architecture courses. There's kind of a trade-off. You know, typically memory technologies that are the cheapest, that means typically they're, uh, each bit occupies the smallest amount of area, and that's referred to as the densest. They often are the slowest to access, right? Because you kind of have to go farther to get to them. Uh, and sometimes that density comes at the price of, you know, speed to access. Also, since you often go far to reach these memories and you go through more things to get there, it often consumes more energy, right? So to kind of think about what we've been, we're dealing with, right? Registers are kind of like the fastest thing you often are deal with, but uh, they're also the most expensive. They're the biggest per bit. Uh, and then things like SRAM, which often people think of in pure memory, uh, that's going to be... Um, denser, but, you know, still quite expensive. DRAM, you know, option memory, which is also different technology internally, denser still. Uh, you know, now it's a new world of Optane, so if you're talking about phase change memory or even flash, right? But uh, for this course, of course, we're mostly uh, concerned with registers versus SRAM, right? And for now, you've just about always been doing things with the um, registers. Even in Chisel, if you use the mem construct, unless you change the latency parameters, that combinational read or I should say that asynchronous read is going to be implemented best by a uh, array of registers. If you use the sync read mem construct, that's often going to turn into something like an SRAM or something equivalent. Whew. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm going to keep pausing for questions. There's definitely a lot of material kind of flying by today. Okay. Well, uh, let's keep going then. Um, let's talk about some of those interventions you can take architecturally. First one is banking. Uh, so what's the problem? The problem is our application wants more bandwidth than we are able to make, right? Uh, and so we already talked to our physical design folks. They're saying, you know what? For the memory technology we're using, this is, you know, the most we can do, right? They can only do so many ports. They said for SRAM, practical limit is like two. I guess it's three. You're really paying for it. Um, if you get your SRAM down to a single port, a lot of people will be happy with you <laughs> in terms of what you need from it. So fewer ports is better. Um, and, you know, sometimes you can spend more and make merge technology a little faster. Even a given SRAM design, you can spend more area and make it a little faster. But there's limits to that, right? And so at the end of the day, um, you just aren't getting the throughput you need, right? 
And so what do you do with banking? Well, you take your memory and break it up into multiple memories, right? So your capacity is conserved, right? It's the same amount of capacity. It's just instead of coming from one large memory, it comes from multiple smaller memories, right? And you know each bank uh, can serve requests independently. And you know so that's great. Now you have you know more request throughput, right? If I had to say, for example, we were in SRAM, and SRAM only lets me have two ports, or let's say here in the like, diagram only one port, for example, or in this case one read slash write port. Uh, okay, I have a one port SRAM. Well, I only have one port. If we're breaking into two memories, now I have the same capacity of half size. So each is half size, so it combines the same amount of memory. But now I have twice the throughput in terms of requests. Now, of course, you're wondering, wait a second, how do I make sure requests go to the right banks and that kind of stuff? We'll come down in just a minute. <laughs> but for now, just the picture is, yeah, so you're taking your memory and breaking it into more smaller memories to get more bandwidth in and out of it, right? So would it be uh, ports or, or, or other things that's kind of able to break it up? Um, and this is the kind of thing where once you put this capability into your design, this makes a nice parameter for a generator, right? Kind of a number of banks can be a parameterizable knob. And so, yeah, I can turn it down to one bank. You know, I don't need the bank parallelism. Actually, maybe now I need the banks. Maybe I'll need all eight banks or something like that. And you can have that knob to turn. It's a really good knob to have available for certain types of optimizations. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about some of those considerations for banking, right? So I kind of glossed over how do you get data across banks. Uh, and it depends on what you're doing. Uh, often, you want you want to use banks for is partitioning your data, right? So in other words, each bank has you know, you know, a unique partition or subset of the data, and does people pro a mapping problem of you know requests coming in, requests coming out, how they know which bank to go to, usually do some sort of hashing uh, on the memory address, um, and to kind of map those accordingly, right? Now you may wonder, wait a second, what happens if multiple requests coming in access the same bank? You have a structural hazard at that point, right? And so depending on how things are set up, you may need to stall. Uh, one of those requests while the other one's being serviced, for example. Uh, so, you know, assuming you have enough banks and the requests are, you know, well enough distributed over your banks, um, this hop hopefully happens rarely and you can kind of tolerate it. Uh, but you can imagine, you know, if you have a very adversarial access pattern, a very poor hashing pattern, perhaps you really kind of pound on the same bank too much. Um, that can happen, but hopefully you can avoid it. Uh, and usually, you know, uh, you can usually get your requests kind of spread out across different banks and you have that nice throughput increase and get the effect of having a highly ported memory for, for you know, much cheaper using building out lower, uh, low port count memories. Um, the other scenario is where you really want to increase your port count. Um, you actually can replicate the data, right? So rather than having requests be sent to, I need to go to this specific bank, that's the address that's only available in that bank. If you make every address available on every bank, then uh, you know you have this throughput uh, without having to worry about those conflicts, right, or collisions, so to speak. Now there's a big caveat, right? Uh, you know anyone who's done uh, you know cache coherence or distributed consensus is going to recognize the issue, and that is if you have all these copies of your data, how do you keep those copies in sync if you want to change them? So typically, when you replicate data when you're doing banking, uh, the outcome is you can get uh, many more read ports, but you actually don't really gain more write ports, right? Because usually what happens is you can put as many, you can put reports in each bank, but then uh, to make sure they're consistent, one easy way to do that is to perform a write to all banks at the same time. So in other words, you know, you have n banks, you can maybe have n read ports, but you actually only have one write port, because that one write port is actually writing simultaneously to all n banks, right, for example. So um, this gives you a little bit of sense of the flavor, the kind of depth of this uh, architectural pattern, you might figure this says. Um, in terms of how you actually wire this up, once again, there's more architectural design trade-offs to consider here. Uh, you can have each, you know, uh, bank have its own independent uh, ports to get to the outside world. Uh, alternatively, uh, maybe you can actually have them all share a port, right? So sometimes maybe, once again, this comes down to understanding the constraints of what physical problem you're solving for. If you're talking about things that are, you know, going off chip, reducing the number of pins is really important. So perhaps if port sharing makes sense, you're going to do that, right? And for example, DRAM does do that, right? You know, a, a memory module, a DRAM module, has multiple banks, they multiplex the same pins. They use the same pins. The reason why is you really want to cut those pins down. Um, but perhaps if you're on chip, in which case you aren't so worried about pin counting, and it's okay to kind of route more wires, maybe you're okay to have independent ports. One thing you may consider to make that decision isn't just the cost of you know wiring or pins, 
but also how is the latency of accessing memory compared to um, latency of performing requests, right? If a request going in and out of the memory unit is a small fraction of the time access to memory, then it's, of course, very easy to share things. If, you know, it takes a cycle to send the data in and a cycle to get the data out, um, then it's really hard to multiplex, right? You're going to need to have independent ports. Okay, and then a third thing to kind of think about when it comes to banking. And so you're talking about banking kind of as something you did deliberately in order to, um, you know, get more ports, get more bandwidth. Sometimes it kind of this happens, right? Uh, you know, a single memory can only be made so big. And if you want more capacity, you, you just get more memories. So in other words, you kind of have done banking without even trying, right? You have multiple memories. You have the bandwidth available from each memory. Um, and this happens sometimes. Sometimes you really want a lot of capacity and you end up with a glut of uh, bandwidth. But that, that's often the rarity, I would say, in the common case. Usually the more common cases, um, you don't have quite enough bandwidth. You need a little bit of banking to kind of get the right amount of bandwidth you need, right? Cool. Uh, questions on banking? Great question. So the question was, you know, how, how big do you make banks? It really depends on design problem. So in the case of DRAM, your uh, memory specification technology, you know, like DDR3, DDR4, is going to tell you how many banks are specified for that technology. And uh, the, the size of each bank is then going to be the capacity of that module divided by the number of banks, right? So for a given manufacturer across their, their product line for a given technology, you know, these are all my DDR3 parts, which are all, you know, eight banks, for example. Um, you know, if there's different capacities chips, they're going to have different capacities per bank. But they're going to be quite big, right? They're going to be, you know, hundreds of megabits, maybe gigabits per bank. Um, you go zoom in inside a processor chip, look at SRAM, uh, banks may be smaller, right? Uh, a lot smaller, I should say. Uh, there's going to be kind of different trade-off there. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of kind of um, things you consider when you kind of decide how big to make banks, you know, in terms of what are you making banks for, in terms of what kind of parallels you need, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, for example, with an SRAM array, um, it often varies on various on parameters, but you know, a typical SRAM array is on the ballpark of 128, 256 bits on each side, square, right? So 256 by 256, okay, that's 2 to 8 times 2 to 8, or 2 to 16, i.e. 64 kilobits or 8 kilobytes. So that, for example, might be a reasonable SRAM array size, right? Maybe you want to make it smaller array to be faster, maybe it's, you know, a couple kilobytes for an SRAM array. So that's the kind of example. So you can make those pretty small. Um, a couple kilobytes uh, for an SRAM array. And, you know, perhaps when you do the math on your cache and you have multiple banks in your cache, maybe you don't need that many banks. So maybe you actually put multiple arrays together inside the same bank. And so, yeah, there, there's definitely trade-offs there. Cool. Um, yeah, so let's, let's keep talking about more tricks we can do architecturally to kind of help us with our memory uh, challenges. Um, Another uh, thing that may come up is smoothing out the bandwidth demand, right? So we said before, you know, you maybe were complaining, oh my gosh, I don't have enough bandwidth in my memory. Uh, one thing we can do as designers is we can try to smooth out the demand, right? Where uh, we often provision things, build things for the, the peak case, the, the peak traffic, when, you know, it'd be nice to kind of spend a lot less and build only for the average case, right? And a really good real world example of this are roads, right? If you consider, um, you know, your average road, even though you may be on it during traffic, think, oh my gosh, there's so much traffic, I wish they'd build a bigger road. That's still the peak demand moment, right? Uh, even for the most highly demanded roads, there are usually some time periods in which they are mostly idle, right? You know, maybe 4 a.m., 5 a.m., right? And so the result, we kind of build structure for the peak where we want to make sure those roads are big enough to handle traffic. And well, it's not going to totally handle traffic, but it's going to be tolerable. And, uh, you know, even though on average, if you actually take the number of cars that drove across that road across 24 hours in a day, you're gonna find out that you know, the average number of cars is quite low. Um, so there's definitely some trade-offs there. Uh, so it comes to memory demand, same kind of thing, where sometimes your application scenario is gonna have you kind of, you know, I need a lot of memory now, I don't need any memory. I need a lot of memory now, I don't need memory. Whatever you can do architecturally to try and smooth out that demand, you can really reduce the bandwidth required, right? See on the left, for example, you know, if you have very bursty traffic where it has you know, high demand and then low demand, um, if you can smooth it out, that'd be much better. Um, and so we're going to talk about a few different ways to try to make that happen. So one way to make that happen 
to try to overlap computation and communication, right? So, uh, for example, uh, our um, uh, MatMole unit from the last homework, uh, you know, we had a loading phase to bring the data in, uh, and then we compute, and then we, you know, send the data back out. Um, for the homework this week, uh, which will be posted hopefully later today, uh, and it'll be deadline we push back. Don't worry. Um, we will, uh, you'll be taking uh, your MatMole unit and you'll be once again reducing its peak bandwidth demand. Where, you know, um, initially we said we can transfer an entire matrix all at once. Perhaps it's unreasonable. Maybe we can have a more limited uh, you know, amount of communication there, right? So in terms of over communication and computation, this is of course a, a good idea, right? You know, if you are strictly doing only compute or only communication, you know, you're kind of idle. If you can over up the two of them at the same time, you can reduce the amount of idle time and reduce the overall execution time, right? So it's kind of a classic trick. This isn't just a hardware trick, you know, high performance computing does this all the time. And if you look at this, you can kind of think of almost as like a uh, example of pipe binding, right? We're kind of pipelining the fact that I'm doing computing communication and you kind of overlap them at the same time. So, okay, that's one trick you can do is try to overlap communication and computation, have uh, squeeze out those idle bubbles. Maybe we'll pause for any questions on this one so far. Okay, uh, another trick, uh, which is similar, is double buffering. So we want to overlap communication and computation. The challenge is that we may not have enough ports on our memory, right? Like I said, the number of ports is a kind of a recurring theme, right? In other words, where I need some number of ports to perform the computation, and you also need some number of ports to perform the communication. <laughs> and so if we're both trying to do the same things at the same time, there just may not be enough ports. So kind of like, you know, it's kind of like a subcase of banking in a way. Um, we split our memory up into multiple memories or multiple buffers. Um, we're able to compute out of one and communicate with the other, right? Whether it be loading or storing the new data or taking it back out, right? And so, for example, in one phase, we know we have the compute performing out of memory one. Then the next phase is going to memory two, right? So while it's working on memory one, we're communicating with set up memory two. And then the next phase, it can go ahead and work on memory two, right? So here we have these kind of two buffers and we're able to do this, right? And so this is kind of a nice uh, trick. Uh, another reason why you might do this, in addition to the number of ports, is simply just for the matter of not having the communication interfering with the computation, right? Where, for example, you know, as you're loading data in, you may be overwriting things you still need to work use to compute. Having two memories to kind of split that up is kind of a nice thing to have sometimes, right? To kind of separate those kinds of use cases. Cool. And then um, maybe I'll pause here. Is any more questions on these interventions before I go into the last slide? Okay, well then, um, so it's been a pretty dense lecture, but I did want to kind of spend a little bit of time talking about what it means to actually instantiate these memories, right? So we just covered brief motivation about why you should care about memory uh, and some architectural tricks we can do to try to drastically change our design to reduce our memory demands. Um, but what happens when we're actually being more of a logic designer and actually implementing memories? What are we doing? Well, for offshore memories, this is something that's a very deliberate, conscious, you know, High, heavily researched uh, choice in terms of, you know, what memory technology you're using, how many ports or channels you have to access that memory. Uh, that's like a huge big deal, right? I mean, we're using DDR4 having, you know, eight memory channels, something like that, right? That's something you're like really going to think about and plan. Or, you know what, we need to go from DDR to HPM because we need more bandwidth, right? It's something you definitely need to have a lot of deliberate plan to. It's not something you just kind of whimsically switch. Um, which you actually constrain yourself to just being on chip there's still some different scenarios, right? So for an ASIC design, you're know, talking about memory. Normally people think of, S of SRAM, but you kind of toss registers under that same umbrella, right? In the sense that uh, it's still a way for us to hold state. And in some applications, there really is a choice between having an array of registers and an SRAM, depending on certain trade-offs. And you kind of, if you're looking at your costs, optimizations, and various other things, and trying to figure out which one is two to consider, right? And so. When it actually comes to, you know, instantiating those components in your design, uh, you know, SRAM arrays, um, usually you have to kind of uh, instantiate those manually. You say, okay, I'm instantiating this block, and this block is, you know, a 256 by 256 bit SRAM array with one read port and one write port. So double ported, you know, SRAM block. You deliberately say, I want this block, and here's what it is, right? 
Um, and so often the manufacturer is going to, you know, pre-design those SRAM arrays for you. And they're going to say, hey, you know, since you're using our fab, if you sign these NDAs, you can go ahead and use our memories. And here's some preset sizes, right? So then you as a designer to go and decide, oh my gosh, you know, I want a memory that's, you know, 16 kilobytes. And they gave me no memories of 16 kilobytes. I have some that are two kilobytes and some that are eight kilobytes. And now I need to decide from my usage case, how I set shows together, for example. Um, so there's definitely some work there. But you're definitely going to be very manually kind of doing this. Sorry, very deliberately choosing which memory is using. Um, and if you aren't using pre-made things from the foundry, use something called a memory compiler, which is a tool that, you know, given constraints and parameters, uh, designs custom memory for a given technology. Uh, and for example, there's even one uh, being developed here at Santa Cruz by our, my colleague, uh, Matt Guhouse and his group. Uh, OpenRAM, which is pretty cool. It's an open source memory compiler. But you're going you're to need some sort of thing to produce these SRAM arrays, right? So once you've had these SRAM arrays produced, would it be straight from the, uh, the the foundry or from a memory compiler, you deliberately instantiate them. And yeah, it's a lot of work as a designer trying to figure out, okay, well, which ones we use where and how do I kind of treat my designs accordingly? Um, it's a little bit different on FPJs. So FPJs, of course, include memory elements uh, intentionally, right? So it's not just registers, but you have things called uh, BRAMs or block RAMs, the most common. Uh, in some cases, you actually can turn the logic elements, a LUT, into a memory element, a LUT RAM. Uh, alternatively, also sometimes there's something called a URAM in the violence world, which is, you know, a larger VRAM, basically. Um, so it's a little bit different here. Here, actually, I'm really in favor. Normally, my attitude is, you know, let the tools do the work, right? And so with FPGAs, it's actually often possible to write your code in a way where the FPJ tools infer the memories, uh, the memories for you, right? So rather than you saying, hey, I want you to put a VRAM, you say, you write your variable in a certain way and let it infer it, right? Now... There's some trade-offs there, right? If you're really trying to push the last little bit of performance FPGA, maybe you won't leave it a chance and you want to use the intrinsic to, to deliberately instantiate the VRAM. Uh, if you can get the tools to infer it reliably, that's actually, I'd argue, much better. Makes your design makes your design simpler and more portable. Also, when the tool's able to recognize you should use memory there, it's able to make the informed choices, right? Where, for example, uh, if you uh, let the tools have this flexibility, it can make some nice trade-offs where uh, for example, maybe you need uh, a lot of memory. Now, if you use those only in the VRAM units, that's going to spread out the memory for your design over a large fraction of the chip. So those VRAMs are kind of spread throughout the chip. Perhaps um, a really smart uh, tool flow, and sometimes you can figure this out, realize, you know what? Actually, if I don't use all VRAMs for this memory, if I use some of them in VRAMs, some of them as in registers, I actually can put them closer and actually reduce the overall footprint of the design. So this, this is the kind of optimization that's possible if you let the tools do the work. And as I said, in practice, it's much more possible for FPJs than it is for ASIC. For ASIC, because, you know, you're able to kind of create the world from scratch. If you want SRAM, you want SRAM. On FPJ, where there's kind of these trade-offs and architecture is fixed, it's more just a mapping. These things are more interesting to play with these kind of trade-offs. That's why you get the tools to infer it. That's often better. Now, like I said, sometimes you don't get it right. You have to give it a nudge. You definitely look at the output and kind of check what's happening. Whew. Okay. And then finally, in Chisel, what are we doing? So in Chisel, we just say the behavior. So Chisel, when it says a mem or a sync read mem, it's just specifying the behavior of, you know, how many cycles until things go in, the things come out, right? That's all we're doing. Uh, we aren't saying, you know, this is definitely gonna be SRAM or definitely gonna be BRAM. That's, that's not what Chisel provides. Now, depending on your usage scenario, that can lead different paths, right? So for the FPGA scenario, uh, you know, you can just, um, that's fine. You're going to have it emit Verilog. Hopefully that Verilog is emitted in a way such that the CAD tools can infer VRAMs and often can. So that's great. Uh, if you're doing like a ASIC design where you really want to have, you know, like a deliberate SRAM, you want to instantiate it, then you need to deliberately instantiate the SRAM. So in Chisel, there's a mechanism called a black box module, which we haven't really covered a lot in this course, where you can basically have a, looks like a Chisel module on the outside, but you don't provide implementation. The implementation is provided by a Verilog file. And so that's the thing. So if you want to incorporate some Verilog into your design, that's one way of doing it, right? So you kind of have two choices, right? If you could either A, you know, take your chisel design, turn it into Verilog, and then uh, plug into the other Verilog at the simulation level, or B, you could uh, even mark the fact you want to inject Verilog in your chisel design, and then when the Verilog is submitted later on, the two kind of mesh together really nicely. Um, and so yeah, you probably gonna want to use a black box for these, you know, specific, you know, SRAM arrays from your vendor. Um, and when it comes to chisel and memory ports, right? If you remember when I introduced memory uh, now, a few weeks ago, I kind of mentioned how you could do this kind of very nice 
natural wave, you know, putting the memory on the left or right. If you like to operate with kind of like you're just reading an array, very nice. Uh, you also can say, um, make a deliberate read port or deliberate write port or even a read slash write port. And that way you won't be very conscious about your port count. That's one way you can kind of do things and deal with things. Okay, so uh, that's a lot. But that's kind of a, you know, a fire hose tour of, you know, memory and how to optimize it. Um, and pause for any uh, questions. Absolutely, right? Yeah, so yeah, the question was, wait, this seems like it's hard to optimize some of this memory stuff uh, in Chisel. Yes, so to give a little more context to that, uh, let's consider some optimizations we talked about, things like uh, double buffering, overlapping communication computation, uh, smoothing out bandwidth demand, or banking. These are things that we're going to implement at the Chisel level, right? We're going to make a parameter, you know, the controls, number of banks, for example, number of ports. Um, but you're absolutely right that knowing the need this is necessary, that's gonna require you pushing it through and getting some feedback from a hardware tool telling you, hey, you know, guess what? You know, you can only make memory at this speed and as a result, your design goes at this speed and you decide that's not fast enough and I want to go faster, right? So you definitely need to have some sort of, you know, profile guy optimization to your efforts, right? Somehow know what things are costing and have an idea how to go about fixing it. But when it comes time to making the intervention, you're definitely gonna do it at the chisel level. You're definitely going to, you know, do the banking or something like that at the chisel level. Now, Choosing exactly the right SRAM, you know, macro. Even that might be something you kind of do a little bit of a co-design between your CAD tools and your chisel. For example, you know, maybe you make the chisel parameterized so it's able to kind of access different uh, SRAM macros. So that's now now a generator knob is which SRAM macros I'm using. So, for example, you know, some SRAM macros are kind of predefined blocks. You made different capacities in the reports. And so you can imagine with chisel, when you build a parameterized generator, it's able to kind of take advantage of the fact, that, okay, well, I want to build a memory with you know, exports, however, I'm building it out of subarrays, you know, these, these estimate arrays which only have Y ports, and you know how many is put together to get a certain capacity or certain bandwidth. And so, once again, you kind of parameterize that in a generator, all the kind of connections and accordingly, and then you need to throw to a lot of different design instances at the CAD tools and actually see how it pans out, what the costs are, and performance points are, et cetera, et cetera. So it's kind of more, at that point, it becomes like a design space exploration problem. But to actually build design space capabilities, that's still gonna be you in a chisel level making flexibility. But as I kind of said before, right, you shouldn't perhaps do too much of this optimization until you know where and why you're doing it. I hope that kind of answers your question. Great. Um, so before I sign off, I did want to make one brief announcement about the project. So um, as I kind of mentioned, we have, a, we, have a, we have another homework assignment to go. Uh, but uh, we do want people to start thinking about the project. Uh, they kind of give you a you know, 30 second timeline the timeline is basically being your proposing projects next week and then um, presenting them in week 10. And they're going to be pretty, pretty modest, right? We're talking about, you know, you and a partner uh, are going to you know, propose and design and generate it from scratch, right? So you're going to have an idea of what you want, you know, um, parameterize it, make some revisions, improve it, et cetera, and then present it to the class. Um, and so uh, my point, for, I'm talking more about this on Wednesday, but I want to give like a, Warning if you haven't already followed us a little bit, maybe think about uh, who you might want to work with. If you really want to work alone, that's okay. I can scale the expectations for the size accordingly, but you know, it's a good chance to work with someone else. I think it's a good skill to learn. Um, and uh, also think about a topic or a thing you want to build a generator for. Uh, and if you're com completely stumped, oh my gosh, I don't have uh, a partner, you can reach out to Slack or instructors. If you need a project idea, us as in, you know, the staff have plenty of ideas as well. So if you are completely stumped on project ideas, yeah, we, we have some ideas we have in mind we can kind of share. Um, so yeah, so I want to kind of get that going. So maybe start thinking about that in the back of your mind about what you might do. I'll give a little more details on Wednesday, but I just want to kind of plant that seed. And with that, uh, I just want to end lecture and wish everyone a good day. And fix this recording. <laughs> <laughs>